Welcome to Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about the surgical treatment of degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis. So as a review, lumbar's low back, spondylolisthesis is abnormal slippage of the bones one on top of another. So this is your low back, there's your back, there's your belly. What can happen over time, and this is usually kind of arthritis related, is one bone can slip in front of another like so. And if there's abnormal shifting, what can happen is you can get back pain because of the abnormal shifting. You can also get buttock and leg pain because the nerves that are in the back of the spine as the bones shift can actually pinch a nerve. So here's an example of a spondylolisthesis, often at L4, L5, and the surgical treatment of it really depends on a lot of different things and so you'll have to talk to your surgeon about it but i will say that usually when there's a lot of instability or a ton of motion between one bone and the other sometimes it's not good enough just to take the pressure off of the nerve sometimes it has to be stabilized with a fusion to stop the abnormal motion there's a lot of nuances around whether or not to decompress the patient only which is take the pressure off the nerves alone or whether or not to decompress and fuse a patient to connect the bones together to make it solid. In general, if there's not a lot of abnormal motion and patients meet certain criteria, meaning they mostly have buttock and leg pain, I will try to not fuse a patient that has spondylolisthesis. There's lots of good studies that have come out now that show that you don't always have to do a fusion when you have a spondylolisthesis. A really nice technique is something called a minimally invasive lumbar decompression. A lumbar decompression essentially involves going in and just removing some of the bone that's pinching the nerve. And there are lots of different kind of anatomical preserving ways to do this, to leave a minimal surgical footprint. A really nice way is something called a ULBD. So that's a unilateral laminotomy bilateral decompression. So unilateral laminotomy means, unilateral means one-sided. We go in from one side, but then we can cut across and decompress the other side from this one side. So we basically make a small incision in the midline, make a little opening, then cut across to open up the spinal canal. So here you can see that both sides have been decompressed from that one side. That's a nice way of preserving almost all the anatomy. And by doing so, it kind of decreases the risk of what's called post landomectomy instability because what can happen is as you take pressure off the nerve, you can get just by taking some of the anatomical structures away, even more instability. Here's a good uh, example of a patient who has instability, has nerve compression, you can see in the middle of the spinal canal. Um, and here uh, is the dura, which is the covering over the nerves, and we've kind of come from one side up and over to the other to basically take the pressure off the nerve. Um, even if we don't do a ULBD type technique, there are ways to kind of make a, a midline incision and bow, go on both sides while preserving a lot of these ligaments and structures that would prevent worsening of the instability. The reality is most patients with significant instability or lots of motion from the spondylolisthesis should be fused and there's lots of good literature to suggest that. And there's really two goals. The first goal is to take the pressure off the nerve and the second goal is to realign the spine and lock the spine and fuse the spine so it's in a position um, that's normal. As spine surgery has evolved, we've kind of moved towards less and less invasive ways to do different types of lumbar fusions. You'll have to talk to your surgeon about it. I do all different sorts of lumbar fusions and it really just depends on each patient's particular case. I'll talk about four or five of the most common ways to do a lumbar fusion for spondylolisthesis here and some of the risks and benefits. As we move towards smaller and smaller surgery, the goal is less lengths of stay, less soft tissue disruption, etc. So no matter how you do the fusion, almost all of these techniques involve the use of what's called a pedicle screw. So a pedicle screw is a screw that goes into the bone that anchors into one bone, anchors into another, and then the bones are held in place so that bony fusion can occur with the use of a rod and screw. So this is what pedicle screws look like. So here's a lumbar spine, and there's a back, there's a belly. So these are the pedicle screws and the screws go from back to front and they're big screws. They're kind of the, almost the size of a, of a, a pen, but they get driven in from the back to the front very carefully and they connect by a rod and the rods are held in place with the use of these little screws that go into the, the cradle of the screw. 
So the first type of fusion that can be done is that the most traditional type was just called a posterior lateral fusion. That involves going to the back of the spine, making an incision in the back, taking the pressure off the nerve, what's what's called a laminectomy, and then we put in the pedicle screws like that. And now it's stable and then some bone graft is put in the back which is usually a mix of your own bone. So we take the laminectomy bone, which is the bone we've taken off, recycled it. And we've kind of put it back here for what's called a posterior fusion. So that's called a, a posterior lumbar fusion. And that's kind of the most traditional, we would consider the gold standard. As spine surgery has evolved, we've tried to make less and less invasive ways to do this and also ways to give you higher fusion rates. Because one of the issues is, this has only become successful if the bones ultimately connect and grow together. The hardware is only there to hold the bone together so the bones can fuse. Well, it turns out that one, a really good way to get the bones to fuse better is to do something what's called uh, interbody. So inter means between and body is a vertebral body. So here you'll see, for example, there's a little structure here in between the body and that used to be the disc. So there's a normal disc. The disc is the cushion between the bones. But when you do an interbody fusion, you take the disc out and you put a cage in between and that cage is filled with a bone growing substance so the bone can grow through and through across the cage. To usually supplement um, and allow the fusion to occur, there's three different types of interbody fusions that are done and your surgeon will talk to you about these, but these are all very reasonable ways to kind of achieve a good fusion along with the use of pedicle screws. The first is called an A-lift, which is an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. The next is something called an L-lift or a lateral lumbar interbody fusion. And then there's something called a T-lift, which is transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. So there's an A-lift, which is done from the front, anterior L-lift, lateral, done from the side, or transforaminal, uh, done from the back. Sometimes you'll see the term P-lift or posterior lumbar interbody fusion. That's kind of similar to a T-lift also done posteriorly. So an anterior lumbar interbody fusion is done through a small incision over the abdomen. Um, obviously there are structures in the way, so the risks of surgery, um, the bowel is there, the bladder is there, there's lots of blood vessels in the front of the spine. Interestingly, um, this is a very, very elegant approach. It's very common. We usually do it with the help of a vascular surgeon because the vascular surgeon helps us navigate the blood vessels. But the really nice thing about an ALIF is in the front, you don't see a ton of nerves. So in the front of the spine, in order to take that disc out, once you navigate around all the blood vessels, you see the entire disc. So the exposure is usually very, very good. In men in particular, there's a risk of something called retrograde ejaculation. There are nerves at the front of the lumbar spine that are microscopic that for a male, they actually control your uh, ability to have an ejaculate. So there's about a 3% chance of injury to what's called a, the parasympathetic plexus if that happens and you're a male, you can still have an erection, you can still have an orgasm, you just don't have an ejaculate. If you're a guy that wants to have kids, I usually recommend donating to your sperm bank if you're going to have an anterior lumbar interbody fusion just in case. So once we expose the disc in the front, we take the disc out in entirety and in its place, we put a cage and the cage is usually quite a large cage. So here's an ALF cage. So this ALF cage, you can see there's a hole in it and it's basically filled with a bone growing substance called BMP, which is a very powerful bone growing substance. Um, that substance at uh, very low doses has not been shown to have issues at high doses. There was a loose link to cancer, but at the doses we use it at, there isn't. But basically with the use of BMP, the fusion rate's almost 100%. But if you put BMP or bone graft in that cage and basically insert it into where the disc used to be, that's an A-lift. That's an anterior lumbar and body fusion. Um, here you can see an x-ray. This is a picture of the cage that went in. You can see in the back there are also screws that are supplementing it as well. So that's the A-lift. The next one's called an L-lift or lateral lumbar inner body fusion. So um, here you can see is a picture of the patient on the side. Very minimally invasive approach. The incision's only about that big, a um, few inches long, and it's done with tubular retractors. Um, and basically we go through the side, skirt around a bunch of structures. You do have to go through um, a little muscle called a psoas muscle in order to get to the disc. Um, and that's why some people will have a little bit of pain from going through that psoas muscle. But from the side, you can use a tube and visualize through a little hole like that, the side of the spine. Once you're to the side of the spine, 
we use instruments to take out the disc almost like a channel. And once we take the disc out, again, just like the A-lift, we can put in a cage. And the cage that we use, it's a little bit smaller than the A-lift cage front back because it's a channel type discectomy. So once that disc is out on the side, we put in the lateral cage like this from the side. And so you can see compared to the A-lift cage, it's a little bit wider, but not as big front back because you're not coming through the anterior type approach. So the lateral fusion is a great option. I like that option, particularly higher up in the lumbar spine, L2, 3, L3, 4. Sometimes at L4, L5, there is a link to um, what's called a femoral nerve palsy. So there are nerves that drape, particularly L4, L5, right over the front of the disc space. Um, and so at L405 in particular, a, a relatively well-known kind of side effect of the operation is numbness and tingling and sometimes pain on the side of the approach because of nerve stretch. It almost always does get better, but it's a known kind of side effect of the lateral approach. And also because you go through that muscle, which is a psoas muscle, some people get some um, issues when they're lifting their hip up. They can get some pain because of some disruption of that muscle. But the lateral lumbar fusion is a great approach. I very much like that surgery, um, particularly for certain indications in order to give good stability to the spine. You are going through the side. There is a risk of bowel injury, again, femoral nerve palsy. Uh, those are relatively small um, and in general is considered a really good approach for fusing the lumbar spine. I also tend to like the lateral surgery because for patients that have some scoliosis or curvature in this direction, because if the spine is curved, once you access it laterally and release it, it can tend to straighten up the spine pretty nicely with a lateral approach. The next approach is the T-lift, which is, I would say, probably the most common approach for a lumbar fusion these days, the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. So that involves typically going from the back and taking this joint off. It's called the facet joint. Once you remove the facet joint, you can easily have access to the disc and you take the disc out and then put a cage in. The cage used for a T-lift is the smallest of the three cages because you have these little yellow things in the back called nerves and you so can't really negotiate around the nerve safely without a small cage. Um, and so this is what a T-lift cage looks like. So you can see it's a little bit smaller. Um, and still has a hole where you can put bone graft. But basically this cage, once the disc is out, the cage is put in from the back into the disc. And here you can see um, an x-ray of a T-lift cage with bone screws in the back. Um, the T-lift does not come with the risk of bowel injury, vessel injury, femoral nerve palsy, etc. but it definitely has a disadvantage of having a smaller footprint. Um, there's different kind of strategies we can use to do a really nice discectomy, still remove all that disc so the bone can grow across. And very often we'll pack bone graft into the disc space defect and then put the cage in. Um, the the A-lift, the L-lift, the T-lift are all meant, really the cage is meant to give it structural height and there's bone graft or BMP in between that allows bone to grow. With almost all of these surgeries, the surgery length is about two to three hours. If you're doing a lift from the front, you do have to flip the patient to go to the back. Usually the a lift is about a one hour case. And when you put screws in the back, it'll take another hour. The lateral procedure is actually very quick. That's usually a 30 to 45 minute case from the side. Um, and then we'll also put screws in the back, which would take approximately an hour. And the T lift from the back, we, where we take the disc out, put the cage in, um, that can also be a couple of hours. Um, Post-operatively, most of these patients, whether it's done from the front, the back or the side, typically spend um, one, sometimes three days in the hospital, depending on how many levels, how invasive it is. Postoperatively, I have my patients wear a corset, which is a soft brace. That soft brace is usually for six weeks. We start physical therapy at eight to 12 weeks. And usually, no matter how you do the fusion, the bone still has to grow biologically across and cause the fusion. That's usually a six month to one year process. Um, there is a risk, and there's no question by fusing one level, you stiffen that level and you translate load to the level above and below. So there is something called adjacent level disease that can happen one to 3% per year. So 10 years, 10 to 30% chance that 
let's say you fuse L4, L5, you might develop problems up high at L3, 4, below at L5, S1. That's just a natural consequence of fusion. A lot of people ask if I have a fusion, doesn't that mean I'll be like totally stiff, won't be able to move? The reality is of, if you have a one or two level fusion, patients have no difference in range of motion. They're still able to move because they move the segment above and below. If you have three, five, seven levels fused, that's a little bit different, but usually a one or two level fusion doesn't affect range of motion that much. Ultimately, there's lots of different ways to do a fusion for spondylolisthesis, and sometimes a fusion is not even needed. Please consult your surgeon about what approach is right for you. Usually with the fusions, sometimes we also do what's called a laminectomy, which is just taking the pressure off of the nerves, and you can look at the risks and benefits of laminectomy in the lumbar stenosis YouTube video, but the increased risk of a laminectomy is nerve injury because we're working around the nerve. Um, and sometimes there's a dural tear, which is a tear in the covering of the nerve. That can happen up to three to 5% of the time. If that happens, we repair the tear, lay the patient flat for one or two days. If the laser recovered, it doesn't change the ultimate outcome of surgery. Um, and sometimes with these approaches, because we're correcting the deformity or increasing disc height with the cage is a little bit of nerve stretch. So some patients can get some post-surgical leg pain, which is called radiculopathy, it usually gets better over time. Now that we reviewed the risks, let's talk about some of the benefits of doing a fusion for degenerative spondylolisthesis. Most patients are having a fusion because they have back pain and they have associated buttock and leg pain because of nerve compression. In general, fusion for degenerative spondylolisthesis and decompression is much better for treating buttock and leg pain than back pain, although both can benefit. From a leg pain perspective, in terms of buttock and leg pain, there's about a 90 to 95% chance of taking away the majority of the pain. So what does majority mean? Majority means more than half. It is unrealistic to expect to have zero leg pain after surgery. And that's because there's already some injury to the nerve that's already, already occurred before we got there to do the surgery. Most of my patients based on our registry have a preoperative leg pain score of about a seven and a half to eight out of 10. And at one year postoperatively about a one and a half to two out of 10. So again, much better than it was before surgery just not perfect, and that is because of probably some nerve injury that's already occurred. It is important also to understand that nerves take a long time to heal, and I usually don't make a judgment on how much leg pain goes away until one year, because it can take up to a year for those nerves to heal. In terms of back pain relief, there's about an 80% chance of taking away the majority of back pain, so meaning more than half. Back pain's a lot tougher just in general from a surgical treatment standpoint. That's why we like to operate on patients that have more leg pain than back pain. Back pain may be coming from the spondylolisthesis, and if it is, when we fuse it, the back pain should get a little bit better. But back pain is multifactorial. It can come from the other different levels. It can come from arthritis, et cetera. We have lots of literature in surgical treatment of degenerative spondylolisthesis that show that quality of life markedly improves after this type of fusion surgery. Uh, again, surgery is not meant to make you perfect, but it's meant to make you have a better physical and emotional quality of life after surgery. Hopefully now you understand some of the risks as well as some of the benefits to uh, fusion surgery for degenerative spondylolisthesis. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like and subscribe button and leave any questions in the comment box below.